So I'm Brian Wildenthal. It's a great honor to uh, be presenting. This is actually my first presentation at an authorship conference, and I was thinking the first authorship conference I ever attended was just five years ago this month in Pasadena, and uh, I arrived there. I knew, nothing, knew no one in the um, Oxford Society and really just had kind of a vague interest in authorship. So let this be a warning to all of you. <laughs> you could, if this is your first year at a conference, you may end up being uh, pulled in and be presenting something. And I was honored to be elected to the board last year too. So look out, that could happen to you as well. So the subject of my talk this afternoon is early authorship doubts, by which I mean questions and doubts about the authorship of the works of Shakespeare that were raised or expressed um, in the strong sense before 1616, during the lifetime of William Shakespeare or Shakespeare, however it was pronounced, of Stratford. And in a broad sense, early doubts certainly would include doubts that were raised or published or expressed even after his death um, in the 1600s and then in the 1700s. Um, I call those early posthumous doubts because they're still early, but they're after the death of the Stratford man. Um, and obviously, authorship doubts, what I would call modern authorship doubts, as we all know, arose and gathered tremendous force in the mid-1800s, the 1850s, basically, with the Baconian theory, and then, of course, the Oxfordian theory and other theories. My contention, essentially, is that early authorship doubts have been a, a somewhat overlooked, or there, there's just been less focus or less systematic focus on these early authorship doubts, and, and I think they are extremely important. And although we've known about them, many of us have studied them, there have been a lot of different books and articles that have developed this or that early doubt, um, I haven't really seen yet kind of a, a systematic presentation highlighting them. Now, I myself really have done little or no original research here. I'm relying almost entirely on the excellent work that many other authors and writers have done. So taking up Roger Stripmatter's point, um, I do have a whole bunch of slides at the end of the presentation with some cover pages of various books. I did want to mention Diana Price's book, of course, she discusses quite a few of these early expressions of authorship doubt. Catherine Children's recent, richly documented book, a wonderful book, discusses quite a few of them. And I, I have a slide also recognizing some recent articles in the Devere Society newsletter. I'm not sure if Alexander's here yet this morning, but I want to credit him and a couple of other authors, as you will see. So there, there, here's the outline of what I want to discuss. First of all, I want to argue there are two key Stratfordian claims um, that I see kind of at the center of the, uh, of the orthodox argument. And uh, I want to defend and explain why I argue, which some might question, why the issue of early doubts from the orthodox standpoint denying there were any of these early doubts, why I would call that the central Stratfordian claim. One might think maybe their central claim is all the evidence they claim in favor of the Stratford theory, but I've got a reason for that. Then I want to look briefly at how far Stratfordians have gone in denying early doubts. And the answer is pretty, they've gone pretty far out on a limb there. And I think we may be in a position to saw off that limb and make a powerful point about the reality of early doubt. So my next point is the surprising extent and importance of early doubts. And here is where I'm just relying, I'm essentially just collecting and synthesizing work that has been done previously by others because I think it hasn't yet kind of been collected into one place and kind of systematically framed and argued. Now I have uh, essentially what's amounting to a book manuscript which I may break into pieces and maybe publish an article uh, of part of it. If you're really, really curious to see it, I can send you the link. The draft is actually posted publicly on SSRN, the Social Science Research Network.
work, which law professors use a lot, and I'm other humanities and social science professors, it's still not quite ready for prime time as a manuscript. Once I've worked on it a little bit further, I'll be sending it out and seeking out more feedback and peer review. But I have a rough uh, write-up of this already. So that's what I want to cover here. So let's move right along. So why do I say these are the two key Stratfordian claims? Well, I've seen when I go onto Amazon and look at reviews of books on Amazon.com, when I've looked at articles like the Newsweek article about the Shakespeare authorship issue, or the occasional articles in the mainstream press, and you look at the comments that follow up, I've noticed again and again and again the defenders of the orthodox view end up harping on two key points. They say, well, there's just tons of evidence. Everyone at the time thought Stratford was the author, Shakespeare Stratford. There's lots of evidence he was the author. How can these idiots question that? And then they say, and nobody ever doubted this. You know, during his lifetime and for years afterward, nobody raised this question. So why are we suddenly, at this late date, hundreds of years later, how can this be a reasonable question? And the strongest version of the no early doubts claim is that there were no doubts raised in this very early period, pre-1616, no doubts in the 1600s, none in the 1700s. The strongest version of this claim is that not until the 1850s, more than 200 years later, were there any doubts. And, and I, just, I see that repeated again and again. And then, of course, our task in terms of responding to that would be, I think, to focus on those arguments and be very systematic about rebutting them. Now, on the issue of ample early evidence, so I said, you know, those are the two key claims. We have, obviously, a lot of good work. Diana Price's book, just for example, there's many other great books, but hers is probably the single best systematic presentation of the fact that there isn't ample early evidence. There's this mysterious gaps, there's no contemporary evidence before 1616 that seems to identify, you know, Shakespeare of Stratford as the author. So I think we're, uh, we're kind of prepared and we're really on to that point. I think people need to just remember to always hit back and say that, you know, Diana Price and others have pointed out. On the no early doubts, I don't think our response just in terms of our you know, effective presentation and kind of pouncing on that has been as ferociously systematic as it should be. Now, why do I say that this is the central claim? Um, well, it comes back to this book. If you look at the Edmondson Wells book, the interesting thing is when you push the orthodox advocates on um, these claims, they actually do back off a bit on the ample early evidence claim. And, and as I said, and we have, I think very systematically, we have books like Diana Price's that have effectively responded to that claim. In addition to citing Diana Price, let's be sure to cite Sir Stanley Wells. So in his key essay in this 2013 book, <clears throat> he starts out saying there's an abundance of evidence that Shakespeare of Stratford wrote the works. The end of the essay, last sentence, I think, he says, the evidence is overwhelming. To dispute it is to challenge the entire validity of historical research. You know. However, let's, let's be sure to um, <coughs> cite this. In the middle of the essay, he, he blurts out a confession, actually, in sandwiched in between these two other uh, <coughs> points. Is that still picking up? Okay, I didn't want it to get too close. He says, when it comes to, despite this alleged, what he calls this mass of evidence, the alleged mass of evidence, uh, there is none that explicitly and incontrovertibly identifies Shakespeare the author with Stratford upon Avon. Of course, then one, how could none equal overwhelming or abundance? Um, by contrast, as we will soon see, orthodox scholars, including Sir Stanley Wells, go much farther uh, in denying any early doubts. And so that is interesting to me. And they're, they're both much more emphatic and categorical in denying there were any early doubts. 
And I think correspondingly, we've been, I think it may, maybe a bit too hesitant and a little bit um, not as focused or aggressive as we could be in responding on the no early doubts point. But why is that? So kind of trying to analyze the thinking on the, on the orthodox side. Why is it so important to Stratfordians to deny or overlook, consciously or not? And I, I think a lot of people in the orthodox camp, they're not being subjectively dishonest. I think they really believe what they believe, it's just they haven't thought through it and they've never looked into it and they don't know what they don't know, essentially. And of course, um, when we look into why it's so important for them to deny this reality, why is it correspondingly important for doubters to highlight that reality? I think those adhering to the orthodox view are deeply invested in denial of early doubts because this really enables them to uh, divorce the authorship question from its true historical context. It enables them to quarantine the SAQ in time, meaning in modern times. This makes it possible for them to dismiss the SAQ as a romantic anachronism. Remember, anachronistic means literally out of time, contrary to the proper time. And there's a whole, there's a whole shtick, really, that academics have. They get into all this academic jargon. They say it's a contingent product of modern culture. The authorship question is about us modern defined broadly to start with the Victorian periods. I'm including from the mid 1800s right up to today as modern authorship doubts. They say, you know, we're anti-authority. We like to question authority. It's the age of fake news. These are conspiracy theories, etc. romantic ideas. By denying early authorship doubts, that really sets the stage for this central dismissal. Now, how far have they gone in denying these early doubts? Well, pretty far. And here I want to give credit. So Julia Cleave, who's a Devere Society member in the UK, wrote a very important article in 2014 in the Devere Society newsletter on posthumous early doubts. Now, my particular focus of my synthesis is going to be on the pre-1616 doubts, but eventually I or someone else should maybe build. This is a, it's a very short article, but Julia really deserves credit for laying this out. Someone should build on it and write up a lengthier version, maybe Julia herself. And as Julia notes, she quotes some of these key claims. So I, I found a couple extra myself, but she really provided these quotations. And the orthodox advocates have gone well beyond what might have been a safer, uh, more careful claim. They could have claimed, for example, that no one before 1616 specifically denied that Shakespeare of Stratford was the author. So you don't find publications saying, you know, I don't think, or a letter saying, I don't think Shakespeare of Stratford was the author. Of course, nobody said he was either, and you don't generally deny something that you're not thinking about, you don't have a reason to think about in the first place. Um, and but here I want to, this is just to give credit. Again, I have more slides at the end, which I may not have time to get to, but I did want to just say that there was a remarkable series of articles on early authorship doubts in 2013-14 in the DVS newsletter. Alexander Waugh, Julia Cleave, Jan Cole, Patrick O'Brien, possibly others that I've missed, and I'll come to some of these specific points. Many of us know about Alexander's article on Covell's Polymantia, which has the intriguing anagram. But there were a number of others. So I think American and Canadian Oxfordians, um, I'm from San Diego, we need to join and support the Devere Society as well as the SOF. You get their newsletter, you're missing out on some fascinating material. So hail Britannia, let's hear it to support our colleagues in the Devere Society. So here's an example. Professor Shapiro, uh, at least the publisher of his book on the flyleaf says, for more than 200 years, no one doubted that Shakespeare had written his plays. <clears throat> uh, now, the book itself is a little more subtle, and what's funny is Professor Shapiro, it's right in front of him, but he doesn't see it. So he discusses a number of items back to the 1590s, which, in fact, suggest early authorship doubt but he doesn't seem to recognize it. I mean, he, he doesn't even deny that they do, he just misses it. 
And, and he does discuss a few items from the 1700s, so early posthumous doubts, but he dismisses them. He says, oh, so people were joking about authorship. Of course, missing the fact, why would they be joking about something if it wasn't still an issue? No one's joking about Ben Johnson's authorship in the 1700s. And he makes a revealing confession. He says, it's just, it's hard to imagine how anyone before the 1840s could argue that Shakespeare was not the author. He just like, he can't even really imagine that. And if you can't imagine something, you're not likely to see the evidence in front of your face. Uh, Sir Stanley Wells, going back to 2013, so not only, it's interesting, he concedes that really there's not that much early evidence. I mean, he claims there's ample early evidence, but then his, on, his scholarly honesty gets the better of it. He says, okay, if you want to get technical, there's none, <laughs> actually, <laughs> before 1616. But he doesn't back off on this. He says no one expressed doubt until the middle of the 19th century. He doesn't qualify that. Tom Reedy, David Kathman, they go way out on a limb on their website. Let's just go to Sir Jonathan Bate. Um, who is a very impressive scholar in some ways, and there's some ways in which he has been willing to change his view on some issues, but on this no early doubts, he is way out there on a limb. In his 1998 book, Genius of Shakespeare, which was republished 10 years later, he says, uh, no one in Shakespeare's lifetime or 200 years after expressed the slightest doubt. And there's 10 years later, just recently, he's thought about this some more, this interview is posted on YouTube, Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. I hate to publicize it too much. It has very few views so far. It's a sort of a 10-minute little interview in which he's addressing the SAQ. And he says, kind of rhetorically, he says, when did the SAQ begin? Well, round about the Victorian period. For over 200 years after 1616, nobody questioned that Shakespeare the player from Stratford was the writer. For 200 years, the question didn't occur to anybody. Nobody had any doubts. They're way out on a limb here because there are, in fact, a surprising number of expressions of early doubt. So let's get into some of these. Basically, it's wrong. <laughs> the questions did begin during Shakespeare's own time. They weren't just a modern fad. Now, I've been told when I've previewed this talk, people love to kind of get into the specifics here, so I want to do these. This is not an exhaustive list. I can't claim credit. I didn't discover any of these. Um, uh, people like Diana Price, John Michael in his book, Who Wrote Shakespeare, Catherine Children has covered some of these, Waugh, Cole, O'Brien, others in the De Vere Society articles. Some of them are probably familiar to you. In 1589, and there was some discussion about this item uh, the other day at this conference, uh, Thomas Nash publishes a preface to Robert Greene's play, Menaphon. It seems to refer to Hamlet, which is a mystery in itself. Orthodox scholars tie themselves into knots. They've dreamed up this Ur-Hamlet that supposedly existed early on because obviously it's a real problem if a... 25-year-old William from Stratford had somehow written Hamlet so soon after uh, his shotgun marriage when he was still in Stratford. Um, Green's uh, Nash's preface does not refer to Shakespeare. Instead, the author is mysteriously referred to as English Seneca. And so that's, that's an indication that the, um, it's a published indication of some doubt about who the author is, certainly not identifying as Shakespeare. In fact, all these items, as you'll notice by the dates, they're leading up to 1593, which is the first time the name Shakespeare appears in print. 1592, Groat's Worth of Wit. Now, I've got a huge section of my manuscript that deals with this, which I have tried to break off as a separate article. Suffice it to say that if you maybe synthesize what Diana Price has argued about Groat's Worth of Wit and what Catherine Children has argued, along with other writers who've suggested maybe it's all about Edward Elaine, not about Shakespeare, and if you bring in what an Orthodox scholar has written, so there's a professor, Lucas Earn, at University of Geneva, who back in 1998 wrote an article about Groat's Worth of Wit, this 1592 pamphlet, and he debunks 
and basically resoundingly refutes what all of his orthodox colleagues, he's an orthodox Stratfordian scholar, but seems like an exceptionally candid and, um, and, and thoughtful scholar. And he argues, for example, that the famous apology by Henry Chettle, who published the Grotesworth pamphlet and then apologizes for it, says, oh, I didn't mean to offend this one playwright who complained, who's a wonderful person, his grace in writing is wonderful. The orthodox scholars all say that's about Shakespeare. Professor Lucas Earn says, nope, it's not even about Shakespeare. Uh, it, that's not an apology to whoever this upstart crow was who was dubbed Shakespeare. And I think Earn is right about that. Price cites Earn, uh, but then Catherine Chilgen comes in with some additional insights. <clears throat> I think we need to synthesize all of this, and uh, at any event, it is an expression of early doubt. One of the funny things about Grotesworth is that it's actually, it's, um, it's stronger evidence of early doubts about authorship if you buy the orthodox view that it's about Shakespeare of Stratford. <laughs> if Catherine Children is right and it's about Edward Elaine, then that eliminates one of their pieces of affirmative evidence, but it also means it maybe is not expressing authorship doubt. The, the expression of authorship doubt is that basically Shakespeare or the upstart crow, whoever that is, is being accused of being a plagiarist who's passing off the literary work of others. So this is a case where I think to our orthodox colleagues say, fine, you, you want to say this is about Shakespeare? Okay, you're admitting there was a big published expression of doubt about whether he was the authentic author a year before he even published anything under his own name. The very same year that Venus and Adonis appears, the first printed use of Shakespeare's name. Gabriel Harvey raises doubts about who the author was. From 1595 to 1602, there's a kind of a whole slew of early authorship doubts. Thomas Edwards, as many of you know, writes this poem, L'Envoi to Narcissus. He, again, refers to the author of Venus and Adonis, never you know, identifies him as Shakespeare. He says, whoever this author was, was deeply masking through in purple robes, disdained. Uh, Professor Strittmatter has written about this. Many others have. So it suggests a hidden aristocratic author. Certainly it indicates some doubt. 1595, Alexander Waugh talked about the marginal note to sweet Shakespeare, printed marginal note next to this anagram, court dear verse, perfect anagram of our Devere a secret. Um, Joseph Hall, John Marston, another publication by Gabriel Harvey, or actually Marginalia by Gabriel Harvey that suggests an alternative author, Francis Mears, John Weaver, whoever wrote the anonymous Parnassus plays, circumstances around the Essex Rebellion. Even Orthodox scholars have sometimes admitted that it's mysterious how Shakespeare was not arrested and tortured at the time of the Essex Rebellion. He's the author of Richard II. It's a well-known fact that the Essex Rebellion plotters arranged for performances of Richard II to whip up fervor, and there is evidence that this was investigated. Queen Elizabeth herself said, know you not, I am Richard II, and yet somehow nobody thought Shakespeare was on the suspect list. Um, it goes on. What's really interesting is there are several published or at least uh, written indications in the documentary record suggesting that the author Shakespeare, whoever that was, had already died before 1616. Uh, so Jan Cole, in the DBS newsletter, has talked about the letter of Sir Thomas Smith, England's ambassador to Russia, lamenting the apparent recent death of the late English Ovid. We don't need to strain ourselves too much as doubters to say that the late English Ovid was Shakespeare. Look up Sir Jonathan Bate, Shakespeare and Ovid. He's made the case that uh, you know, Ovid is central 
to Shakespeare. It's an established fact that Shakespeare was deeply influenced by the Roman poet Ovid. Of course, this fits perfectly with the Oxfordian theory. Oxford had died in 1604. He's being lamented in a letter by a prominent English official the next year. Uh, the late English Ovid has passed. The sonnets, this is not original, but I think we need to maybe come back to this more often and just point out to people that this is hiding in plain sight. The dedication page of the sonnets, in addition to all the fascinating um, encoding and cryptograms that may be there, this isn't hidden. You know, this is not hidden in a code or an anagram. It says, our ever-living poet easily documentable, as Diana Price has done and others, that this is a reference to a deceased poet in 1609. In several sonnets, number 72, number 81, as many others have pointed out, say, the author's telling us, I'm not known by my true name. I've been disgraced. My true name will never be known, none of which makes sense if it's Shakespeare of Stratford. There are a couple of additional items, and there's a rich array in Catherine's book. Uh, a couple of other ones support the idea that Shakespeare had died. I believe I'm up to five separate items, just counting the sonnets as one item, and then the letter from Sir Thomas Smith. There's at least three more that mutually corroborate the idea that Shakespeare, the author, was deceased. So. Our Orthodox friends say we have a 1604 problem. Uh, that's nothing compared to the 1616 problem. One of the most compelling early expressions of authorship doubt, and again, I keep coming back to Price, but others have written about this, and Alexander Waugh recently added a crucial additional insight. Epigram 159, Shakespeare is referred to as uh, our English Terence a reference to a Roman uh, poet who was widely believed, uh, he was a commoner, a Roman commoner poet who was widely believed to be a front man for a hidden aristocratic Roman author. And Epigram 160, which Alexander has noted, refers to Shakespeare's most constant, though most unknown friend, nobody. Um, and this was, uh, I believe it was 1610 written because it was registered in the stationer's office, published in 1611. Uh, the spelling issues, I'm not one that thinks the spelling issue is our strongest argument, but it deserves to be counted as certainly an additional indication of, I think, authorship doubt in a general way. Don't have time to dwell on that one here. Post 1616, just to mention some of the early posthumous doubts, which I'm not even mainly focusing on, but there's such good stuff here. John Sheehan of the Shakespeare Authorship Coalition has very helpfully highlighted two of these in his um, Beyond Reasonable Doubt update to the Declaration of Reasonable Doubt. I think it's an interesting fact, which I'll get to, that there isn't really any mention of early authorship doubts in the original 2007 Declaration of Reasonable Doubt, as magnificent a summary of uh, the grounds for doubt as that is. But in the follow-up, in the 2013 anthology and in the 2016 updates, John Shan has done a great job of highlighting some of these. So if perhaps some of you weren't aware of, Thomas Vickers published a manual of rhetoric in 1624. He identified four great English poets, no mention whatsoever of Shakespeare, which is certainly odd. It's the year after the folio said Shakespeare's the soul of the age, the uh, star of poets. Um, his next edition in 1628, he kind of thought better of this, apparently, and still doesn't refer, doesn't just say, oh, whoops, I left out William Shakespeare. See the folio in 1623. Instead, he says, um, he, he says, I, I should also mention that famous poet who takes his name from shaking and spear. If that's almost explicitly saying it's a pseudonym. 1635, Cuthbert Burbage, brother of Richard Burbage, investor in the Globe Theater, writes to the Earl of Pembroke, uh, Philip Herbert, obviously one of the two dedicatees of the folio. There was some business dispute um, involving the Globe Theater. Someone else had petitioned the Earl, and now Burbage is responding, providing his answer. 
In the course of his answer, he mentions several of the, quote, deserving men players. Shakespeare's not even listed first. There's just a couple of them that are listed. One of them is Shakespeare, spelled Shakespeare. Um, and no mention that he was an author or writer or anything. Just he's a deserving man player. And uh, he's writing to the person to whom the folio was dedicated. It seems like he would have mentioned this was England's greatest poet to build up his case and support his case. But of course, if that wasn't the truth, he's not going to insult the William Philip Herbert's intelligence by suggesting something that presumably uh, Philip Herbert, uh, keep in mind the Herbert brothers, one of them was Oxford's son-in-law, so they knew whatever was going on, they must have known it. 1640, there's this Baudelaireized edition of the Shakespeare sonnets. They're reshuffled in order. Some of the genders are changed to eliminate the homosexual element. The purported author is John Benson, which looks an awful lot like me to be a spoof of Ben Johnson. There's no other evidence for who John Benson was. In any event, he copies the engraving and, and repeats or quotes some of the praise for Shakespeare in the first folio, but sticks in question marks. Some have disputed whether these are meant to be question marks because sometimes question marks were used instead of exclamation marks, but it, it does seem to see, seem the best reading is that this is openly mocking or questioning this. And that's just three items. So here's kind of my summation, really. And I want to leave some time. We've still got 10 minutes, it looks like, for questions. You kind of want to sit back. Again, wrap your mind around all of this. Again, we've, these have been published before. All the pieces are here. But I'm not sure we've ever, um, that many of us have not sort of stepped back and absorbed the big picture. Because I, I myself did not. I mean, I've been reading this stuff for 15 years. And it was only about two years ago because I was subscribing to the De Vere Society newsletter and because John Shane was drafting his Beyond Reasonable Doubt. And it really caught my eye. And I, I wrote John and said, wow, this is really great. I mean, this Cuthbert Burbage reference is killer. And the Vickers reference, the ones I mentioned, 1624, 1635, I didn't know about that. And if we can, you know, succinctly summarize that for people, these really raise questions. And, and I thought, wow, it's really important. If we're trying to argue that there's reasonable basis for doubt today, what could better legitimize that than the fact that Elizabethans and Jacobeans and during, and, and during that whole early period, they themselves had doubts. Consider that doubts and questions, as I have summarized there, about who this author might be, started appearing more than 30 years before the first documented source in 1623 suggested any linkage to Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon. And of course, we know even in 1623, that linkage was elliptical, curious, puzzling, ambiguous, Ben Johnson's double talk, all of that. And there's the monument, let's not even get into that. And doubts continued to be raised after 1623. The orthodox view has always been that, you know, nobody questioned Shakespeare was the author of Stratford. They say that came first, and the authorship doubts were like Johnny come lately, you know, much later, maybe 200 years later. The reverse is true. The Stratfordian theory was the Willie come lately, and in fact, authorship doubts arose first. I think it's difficult to overstate the importance of early authorship doubts. They really do, I think, and, and if they're accepted and recognized, they devastate the traditional dominant academic attitude. Again, recall they dismiss the SAQ as a romantic notion contingent on modern cultural preoccupations. They, they want to isolate it as a modern phenomenon. It's essentially the whole theme of Shapiro's book in 2010. His whole book is basically, he doesn't respond to the authorship doubt issue. He doesn't really engage in our arguments or the evidence. He just kind of sits back in his professorial chair and says, what a fascinating, let's analyze this. Why is it that all these writers, he, anal he literally psychoanalyzes Sigmund Freud. Why did Sigmund Freud have authorship doubts? It's all about Freud's psychology for him or modern preoccupations. He never really addresses the fact maybe Freud was convinced because the evidence was so good. 
if we can highlight the fact that Elizabethans themselves had doubts, then authorship doubt is properly contextualized historically as an authentic, integral part of the very same time and culture that produced the works of Shakespeare. It fundamentally changes the conversation. I do think we need more focus on it. Again, I'm a, I'm a signer of the Declaration of Reasonable Doubt, and there was, that was a magnificent effort and remarkable within four pages to summarize all the reasons for authorship doubt. But it's interesting in hindsight to go back and look at that. There's not a single mention in the 2007 declaration of early published authorship doubts. Again, in the, in the 2013 Shea and Waugh anthology, there is some good discussion, although it doesn't leap out as a prominent central or organizing theme even in the 2013 anthology. But if you read carefully, there are items in there. And as I said, the 2016 update, I think, has not gotten all the attention it deserves yet beyond reasonable doubt, because John Shan does really zero in on some of these early posthumous doubts. But there are so many that are early pre-1616 doubts. So I would suggest there's a new paradigm here. I think if we try to summarize our six overall arguments or reasons to doubt the Stratfordian authorship theory. Number one, and again, the, the single best citation would be Diana Price's book, there's an unusual overall absence of contemporary evidence supporting the theory. But number two, right there in the top two, the striking presence of documented expressions of early authorship doubt. And in this number two, it's maybe number two for us, but I think this really is the central point for Stratfordians. Let me kind of wrap up with there. There's more slides here, but that's essentially the gist of it. Um, so if there are questions or uh, comments, I would be... Thank you. <laughs>